as we continue in restoring a relationship this morning, we have a selection from Proverbs, starting in Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Proverbs 18, 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 22, 24 to 25. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Proverbs 27, 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Proverbs 27, 9 to 10, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. Do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family, and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Lauren. A lot of exciting things happening today in life in the church, including, including today is our first formal kickoff of the youth ministry. We're really excited about that. They can't hear us, but let's, in spirit, they're meeting right now. They're going through the story of the prodigal son, so you can be praying for them. In fact, I want to pray for them now, but that's pretty exciting in the life of the church that we're in a place. Um, so let's pray for them, and please be praying for them as we kick off that ministry, and and are thinking about uh, their families as well. Father, thank you so much that we can gather together and uh, worship you on such a beautiful day in a beautiful place. Uh, thank you that our teens right now are getting to have a place where they really sense, uh, hopefully, we pray, uh, a place of belonging. We pray that that would happen within community for them. But we pray that all the more that they would feel that spiritually in their uh, relationship with you. And uh, Father, would you bless the leaders there? Thank you for their ministry in that. Would it just be a great kickoff day? Bless the, the families of our teens and bless the families of, of the teens who are coming around the corner too in our upper elementary. Would you bless all the kids? Thank you for entrusting them into our care. And the fathers, we turn now to your word. Would you please give us your spirit to understand it as you would have us this morning? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, today we're continuing our series, Restoring Relationship, focusing in on the topic of friendship. So today we're talking about restoring friendship. And I feel like that's an apt topic for our times. Uh, a few months ago, I got together with a group of pastors in the area, and we were sharing together. We were praying for one another. And one of the pastors there uh, shared, he's like, oh my, keep in mind, by the way, this is coming out of the thick of the lockdown and the pandemic and all that sort of thing. One of these pastors shared, oh my goodness, it's as if my congregation has lost, has, has lost how to relate one another. And then he thought about it a little bit more and he doubled down. He said, my congregation has forgotten how to be friends. And I just sat there. We were kind of going around in a circle and sharing, so I wasn't able to kind of like ask and, and dig deeper there. But that really stuck with me. It made an, an impression on me. My, my congregation has lost its sense of how to be, be friends. Uh, Cindy last week referenced a, a, an article in the Wall Street Journal entitled, Why Friendships Feel So Weird Right Now. It's the Wall Street Journal. Why Friendships Feel So Weird Right Now. And how there are surveys showing that over 50% of Americans have felt that they have lost some of their friends during the pandemic. And then about 9% say they have lost touch with most of their friends in and coming out of the pandemic. I mean, these are staggering numbers. Friendship is so important. We know that, right? And friendship is this interesting relationship because it's one of those relationships where you can go through life without friends. I mean, that's, that's possible. You could, you could do that. But we all know that that's also not fun. In fact, it could be quite miserable, let alone the other side of that is we could miss out on so much of the blessings and joys of life that God intends through friendship. But here's the thing, nobody's talking about it. Like who in our society is teaching about friendship? What are the voices out there? I mean, think of it this way. Our culture is infatuated with romantic love. I mean, all our songs are about romantic love. Uh, most of our movies are about that as well. Uh, there was this big blockbuster hit back in, uh, it back, that came out in the early 2000s, a big trilogy. Anybody remember this big movie that was about friendship? Lord of the Rings, 
came out. It's awesome. You know what's funny about that movie? It's a great movie. I love the movie. I love the books even more. If you've been at current, you know, I love, love me some Tolkien. Uh, what's interesting for those who've read the books is uh, the producers made a very interesting choice in making those movies more about romantic love than the books are actually about. So for instance, I'm not going to get into it, but like Aragorn and Eowyn, their love is like, their relationship is like thrown front, front and center in the movies, but their, that relationship is not highlighted in the narratives of the movie. You have to go into the appendices to learn about their love interest. The Fellowship of the Ring, the movies are about friendship. Who's talking about friendship? right now? Who in our, in our culture? Other than maybe, you know, some parents with their little child as they're going to their first day of kindergarten, like, little Susie, go and make some friends. Then later that night, did you make any friends? Yeah. Okay, great. We're, nobody's talking about friends. The Bible has so much to say about friendship. And keep in mind, the Bible was written over a span of centuries, millennia ago, in a time that was far more communal and familial than our modern individualistic Western culture that would probably seem to highlight friendship a little bit more than back then. And yet the Bible has so much to say about friendship. I think it's all the more important in these times coming out of a pandemic where we've lost the habits of what it means. Some congregations are even saying we've lost what it, what it means to be a friend. We don't know how to be a friend to understand friendship. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the book of Proverbs to understand why friendship matters, and along with that, by the way, what friendship is. So why friendship matters and how to forge it. So how to develop it, how to, how to cultivate it. So why friendship is important, why, why it matters, and how to forge it. So first, uh, why friendship matters. Uh, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom, okay? It's a book that basically has all these little short, pithy statements of of sage advice on all various topics of, of life. It, has, it covers all these different themes. And one of the main uh, uh, themes throughout the book is, is, of course, on friendship, even to the point of one commentator putting it this way. The book of Proverbs might almost be called a treatise of friendship. There's no book, even in classical literature, which so exalts the idea of friendship and is so anxious to have it truly valued and carefully kept. That's the book of Proverbs. It really cares about why friendship matters. Okay, so let's look at Proverbs 12, verse 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. So why friendship matters? Number one, it matters because friendship shapes who we are and who we're becoming. Our friends are going to shape who we are, and who we're becoming. I think it's real easy, especially in our modern-day society, to real quickly dismiss this thought and think, no, I'm the one who's shaping who I am and who I'm becoming. It's my choices, my decisions, my actions. But is that really so true? I mean, for instance, our, our family of origin has much to say about how we kind of look at life, how we take it in, how we go through it, how we navigate it. But so too do the people that we surround ourselves with. So for instance, the Bay Area and Silicon Valley especially is known for being an area that, that people come to. It's very, very transient. So statistically speaking, that's, that's many of you. For those of you who've been here for a long length of time and you came from, from outside, how many of you would say you are now different people than when you first came? How much different? And then by the way, how much different are you today because of the people you've been around, their values, their goals, their aspirations. Uh, we are incredibly influenced by the people around us. The classic example in this, okay, and I, I shared this like a, years ago, but I want to go back there because it's just so fun. The classic examples of, of, of seeing how we just like shape and who we are, who we're becoming is the movie Mean Girls. You seen the movie Mean Girls? <laughs> if you've seen it, you already know where I'm going with this. The main character there is a, is a gal named Caddy, and I forget what her parents were doing, but they were like, am I, Kate, Katie, am I saying that wrong? I like the movie, but I'm like, you know, peripherally. I said Caddy, that's actually kind of funny. That, that was not a Freudian slip there, but anyways, she, she, her parents were uh, missionaries, I think, in, in Africa or something like that. Anyway, she, the whole point is she comes back to the U.S. and is thrust into suburbia, you know, high school. 
American high school and just like all the like joys and challenges of that. And she at first makes friends with kind of the more normal people, right? That's really what the movie's trying to get across, like the the normal people who aren't caught up in the superficialities of like all these other cliques at the school. So the jocks, you know, the the cheer squad, and, and most of all, the plastics, right? Who really care about like their outward appearance, what people think about them. They're just all bent on, on popularity, right? Well, I'm sorry, what's her name again? I was going to say it wrong. Katie, Katie okay. <laughs> so Katie is like, she's, she's noticed by the plastic. She's, a, she's an attractive person herself. And, and, and so basically the movie's about uh, her normal friends being like, you should infiltrate the plastics. You should like have fun with that. So she joins the plastics. And what the movie does so brilliantly and, and believably, like Tina Fey, who wrote this story, just really takes you on this ride. It's a really believable experience. Is how, for Katie, there's this complete inward change that happens for her. Because at first, she, like, infiltrates the plastics, and she's, like, a spy among them, like, telling her real friends, like, oh, yeah, they're really that weird, and all that sort of stuff. But little by little, more time after more time, hanging out with these scows, she becomes herself a plastic. And in the end, betrays her true friends and, and is dealing with, with all that. It's really, really well done, even as it's very quotable. Uh, the, the point is, the people that were around, I think we know this if we stop to really consider it, uh, are really influencing who we are and, and who we're becoming. And so the, the question is, are you mindful of that? Are you mindful of the people that you're around? Incidentally, as a quick uh, pastoral sidebar, this is not to say you should only ever be around people who are a good influence. I mean, Jesus is the best example of that. By the way, everybody would have been a bad example in Jesus' standard because he's perfect, okay? So, but the whole point is like, no, as Christians, we're called to love and care everybody. So it's not just a kind of like only fun, right? But you understand what the wisdom here is. Proverbs is saying, hey, the wise are mindful of the people that are around. They're choosing to spend time they're surrounding themselves with because it's influencing who they are and who they're becoming. Friendships matter. Friendships also matter because in some ways the love of a friend is better than the love from a family. Listen to Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Proverbs 18, 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Here's what's so unique and valuable about friendships. Without any sense of obligation, friends choose you. Uh, without any sense of obligation, they, they choose you. Your brother, your sister, they didn't choose you, right? <laughs> Some of you guys laughed a little too hard at that one. I don't know what's going on there. They didn't choose you, but because you have a, a, a sense of, like you have a shared sense of background and memories and that sort of thing, uh, hopefully those siblings are going to be there for you. Your family's going to be there for you again, hopefully, right? Um, but on the other side of that, they're not necessarily ones you, you would naturally just choose to hang out with. I've been blessed to, you know, have that in my family, but sometimes they're just not the folks that would necessarily also be friends. Now, friends are unique in that they, they choose you, but not only that, friends are unique in that they choose to be for you. Uh, in fact, this verse 17 of chapter 17 helps us identify what a true friend is because if it says a friend loves at all times. So there's no such thing as a quote-unquote fair-weather friend. A friend is somebody, a true friend, is somebody who's going to be there not just in the fair weather but also in the, in the stormy weather. So let me ask, do you have anyone in your life around you like this? And then are you in someone's life without any sense of obligation? Are you that type of person for them? Friendships matter because in some ways their love is better than family. And then number three, friendships matter because they can uniquely strengthen us. Uh, Proverbs 27.9 says, Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. I don't know how you feel about perfume and incense, but keep in mind this was written a thousand years approximately before Christ. So about 3,000 years ago. So imagine what perfume meant to them in those days, right? I mean, for for many people, it was their most prized possession. Having perfume, it was something that you only adorned when it was like, man, a very, very, very special occasion. Probably passed it on to your kids and grandkids and all that sort of thing. It was very much a special occasion sort of thing. And keep in mind, this was written in in an agrarian society, meaning there was no plumbing. There were all these animals walking around. Everybody's wearing sandals. You following me? It's like, you, and so when people put on perfume, it was, a, it was a big deal. Like you and I, maybe, I don't know, when you smell perfume, you're like, oh, that's, that smells nice. But for them, it's literally, as, a, as the Proverbs writer says here, joy to the heart. 
Because when you smelled perfume there, it was just like, oh my goodness, this is it's a special occasion. This is a big deal. And all that was, that's the idea caught up here when it says, this is what a, the pleasantness of a friend that springs from, from heartfelt advice. I have a good buddy of mine uh, that will always pick up the phone. I'm so grateful. A pastor friend of mine, uh, going back to my college days, he'll always pick up the phone. And when he can't pick up the phone, uh, he'll text me and say, hey, I'm sorry, uh, does this time frame work for you? And he'll, he'll just make time. And he's a busy guy himself. He's got all sorts of his own issues, but he's just made a point of just being there and picking up the phone when he can or getting back to me when he can. And he's a guy which I could, I, I could just share anything and everything with. And I'm just so grateful for it. He, his knee-jerk response when I share with him is not like, you know, knee-jerk judgment, uh, nor is it just to let something important just slide and not really consider that with me. Uh, but he relationally is essentially a safe haven. Uh, I wouldn't describe it if you were here, but his friendship love is like perfume, right? I mean, it's, it, it's that it's this idea of joy to the heart, just such a gift. Here's the other thing that's really unique about friendship is that friend, friends can give counsel in such a way where they don't really... Uh, from, as, as a person who doesn't really have skin in the game. You know what I mean? Like, friends are just kind of doing life with you. They're kind of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder people. They aren't face-to-face -face like, like a spouse or whatever or, like, or, or a work relationship dynamic that has all other uh, things going on there. They're just kind of going through life. They don't really necessarily have skin in the game as you share different things with them. So they can give unique help in those situations. I have another buddy that I'll call from time to time just to kind of work things out and get his uh, wisdom on because he's just a really wise guy. And uh, it's funny, I don't talk to him just all the time, but every once in a while, I'll say something like, oh my goodness, thank you so much for letting me share my problems with you and for listening and all that sort of thing. And he'll, whenever I say something like that, he'll respond like, David, I love your problems. He's like, I, because they're not mine. <laughs> He's like, I, would, I love to hear other people's problems, not because I'm all about problems, but because, hey, if I can help somebody with their problems and not think about my problems, I love that. And, you know, I just kind of laugh at that. But at the same time, I feel like that articulates what we're talking about here. Because friendship is something where they uniquely in your life without necessarily skin in the game. They're, they're able to listen. They're able to take in what's going on. But they're able to also do it in such a way where it's not like another relationship. Like, say, sometimes with your, your spouse. Now, a spouse could be a friend, but there's sometimes you're in life. There's a lot of skin in the game sort of thing with with different people in your, in your life, but with friends, they can kind of, with an outside perspective, but caring for you, choosing to be with you in that for you, uh, can have a unique uh, take and, and, and offer their love in a, in a unique way for you. So friendship matters because friends influence who we are, who we're becoming. Uh, their love and care is unlike most other relationships, and they can uniquely strengthen us, okay? Friendships matter. So let's look at how we can c cultivate them how to forge friendships. Uh, number one, Proverbs tells us we need to be intentional. So Proverbs 18, 24 says, one who has an unreliable friend soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Uh, family, again, uh, is with you in the beginning, uh, during the rearing stages. Hopefully they're connected with you throughout life afterwards and into the end. But there's something about a true friend that it says they will stick with you uh, over the long haul. And what does that mean, if nothing else, than, other than we need to be intentional? Proverbs 27, 10 says this way, do not forsake a friend. Don't forsake a friend. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous choose, so actively choose, intentionally choose their friends carefully. We've got to be intentional. There was a New York Times article that came out a number of years back that I, that I read called, uh, Do Your Friends Actually Like You? It's kind of a nice little article. Like, I want to read that. Um, do your friends actually like you? And they did all these number of studies. And, and basically, the punchline of this whole thing is all these studies show that in many cases, for at least you know, Americans, uh, they will think that they have a friend, but that friend won't necessarily think of them as a friend. So person A thinks person B is a friend, but person B doesn't necessarily think person A is a friend. It's, just, it's a fascinating study. By the way, it makes me think of, for instance, celebrities or even, to get more real, Silicon Valley, startup, like you make it big, quote unquote. I mean, I could give you personal examples of people I, I know where that's like figuring out who your friend is when all these people are kind of like thrusting themselves into your space and claiming to be friends another way, but it's, it's hard to navigate. 
Uh, one of the reasons psychologists and sociologists and, and other experts uh, in this article were saying it, it, this is the case, that we can think some people are friends when they're not and so forth, is because in general we have a hard time defend, defining what friendship is and we have a hard time actually cultivating, being an, intentional with it. Here's, here's what they say. Friendship is difficult to describe. It's easier to say what friendship is not, and foremost, it is not instrumental. It is not a means to obtain higher status, wangle an invitation to someone's vacation home, or simply escape your own boredom. Rather, friendship is more like beauty or art, which kindles something deep within us and is appreciated for its own sake. Treating friends is like uh, treating friends like investments or commodities is anathema to the whole idea of friendship. It's not about what someone can do for you. It's who and what the two of you become in each other's presence. By definition, friends are people, here it is, that you take the time to understand and allow to understand you. Friends are people you take the time to understand and allow to understand you, but time is limited. So what they're saying, among other things, is our, as a culture... On the whole, we struggle with identifying, valuing, and ultimately cultivating friendships. And what experts are saying is what the scriptures have been saying for centuries, for millennia. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional. You and I, we're going to be busy. We're going to be tired, especially where we live, but we have to be intentional with our relationships because other relationships, especially in the work case, they're going to, those relationships are going to thrust themselves upon you, but you have to be you have to be intentional with friendships. And I would just highlight the fact that there, we have a tremendous gift right around us right now, current family. Uh, just sitting here in this room, you know, the people in front of you and the people behind you are friends, or at least can be friends, people that we can develop and, and go through life with. And, and if all we do is come to church, say, and miss that opportunity by, by like, say, right after the service ends, just like, you know, doing the 50-yard dash and get out of here or whatever. By the way, if that's you, that's fine. Sometimes you have things to go. I'm not trying to set a stigma. <laughs> but the point is, like, if that's all we ever do and we miss out on the opportunity, what's in front of us? It's like, you know what I mean? We're, we're missing out. And that's why we're also highlighting, even as, as Cindy and Lauren did for us earlier, uh, we constantly want to re remind ourselves of service opportunities, not because we just want to get church done, which we want to do, but also because there's this other layer on that is it's a great chance to build relationships. And can I just say this? And this is not in my notes, so we'll see where I go with this. Especially to the dudes here, to the guys, it's like we have a harder time, stereotypically speaking, making friends, developing friends. But I'll tell you what, uh, the operations team, I love that we keep highlighting them. Because for me, building friendships when I was on a, essentially an operations team was, was the best way to do it because you're just pushing things. You're able to get to know each other. We're not, guys in general aren't as good as like over coffee. Like, so how are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> we should be able to do that. I'm just, I'm having fun with this. But you know what I'm saying? But then, but that, but like getting together and serving and, or playing softball, which, hey, softball, there's another little plug. We've got a casual team and a competitive team. Um, it's just, there's something about that. And like, okay, not just guy, gal stuff, but the point is there's ways to build relationships. Small groups, current groups, that's a great place to build friendships. Now, does that mean you're going to go to a small group and, and make a BFF for life? Like, that's not what we're saying. Maybe that'd be awesome. But the point, man, Cindy and I, every group just about, it seems like, when we get to do, right now we're doing a rooted group, it's like, man, a few sessions is, I'm like, man, these are now friends. So the point is, you've got to be intentional. You've got to, groups, uh, grabbing lunch after service, especially as we're back to one gathering right now, coming out of the pandemic, that's, that's something to take advantage of if you can. Got to be intentional. Number two, uh, in terms of forging relationships, we've got to be authentic. Proverbs 27, 6 says, wounds from a friend can be trusted but an enemy multiplies kisses. Proverbs 29, 5, those who flatter their neighbors, by the way, when, when we're reading neighbors today, it's the Hebrew word uh, rea, which also means, it can be translated friend, okay? So those who flatter their neighbors or friends are spreading nets for their feet. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Those who flatter their, their, their neighbors or friends are spreading nets for their feet. We need to be authentic. We've got to be able to let people into our lives such that they can also speak into them. Uh, a while back now, I was taking the kids out on an outing, and uh, so you know how it goes. Sometimes you just have to take a load out to the car, and so both kids were kind of stacked high with like a load that's coming up to their eyes or maybe just higher, um, and we were walking along, getting to the car, and there was this, this uh, flight of stairs, so it was pavement uh, coming up, 
And uh, I was ahead walking with my own, you know, uh, stuff. And I turn around, I'm like, oh my goodness, they're getting ready to like get to the stairs. And on top of that, my 10-year-old son, Caleb, had a strap that was hanging down from his lunchbox that was just kind of like going all the way to his feet and just dangling. And he was just waiting to step on it, right? Or trip on it. So I'm over here, man, just reliving this. I'm starting to feel it. So I'm like, I'm, I'm up the steps and he's coming and I'm like, Caleb, stop. And uh, my little guy, he's, he's awesome. He's like, daddy, don't worry. I see the stairs are there. And like all this is happening in real time. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not talking. Stop, stop. There's not the stairs. He's like, I see the stairs. You know, I'm like, there's a strap. I mean, he doesn't, oh, finally he heard and he stopped. Cause I think I, I probably yelled. I yelled, I yelled. <laughs> stop. <laughs> I yelled. And I was like, and, and he finally stopped. What had happened, right? He had missed, he, he needed outside perspective, right? He couldn't see everything for himself. He needed someone else to kind of speak into that. We need outside friends to speak into our lives sometimes. And by the way, let's continue to highlight the fact that we're talking about friends. And again, coworkers can be friends, spouse can be friends, roommates can be friends. But I'm talking about people who are, who are not necessarily in whatever we're working out or whatever it might be, who can just speak objectively into it with no skin in the game. We need those folks. Uh, it's so important. But I'll say this, we've got to be authentic. We've got to invite that. It's not going to just happen if you just kind of, well, maybe with some individuals, and that's, that's awesome when that happens, especially when they do it graciously, which is an art and gift. But we have to be able to invite someone in to say, hey, I might not be seeing this right. Can you help me see if I'm seeing this right? We've got to be authentic. We've got to bring folks into that. And then conversely, this next thought, I just kind of want to jump ahead here, slide steam, if you want to pull this up. We need to be looking to sharpen one another. So we got Proverbs 27, 17 that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We've got to be willing to actually be that for others as well. Does that make sense? And we, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, speaking truth and love, or we need to be able to bring grace and truth in our relationship, not just truth without grace, because that's like a hammer across the head, and not just grace without truth, because that's, that's not love. We need to be able to do both. And so we need to be able to invite people in that space. We need to be able to, when it makes sense, speak into that space. And again, highlighting the fact that we're talking about friendships. Sometimes you might be thinking, oh, they have a roommate. Maybe that person's saying something to them. They're probably, or they're married. That spouse is probably. You have a unique relationship with them as a friend where you could perhaps be another voice and say something in there. Speak into it. The other thing I'd say too, and this is real quick here, and other Proverbs talk about this. Um, I think it's implied with what we're talking about, but other pro Proverbs get at it more specifically. I'd say, and look to ask questions, because a friend being by nature a little bit of an outsider to whatever dynamic you're working through with them, if you're looking for advice, has to kind of get at that, right? And so you can ask questions, which will feel non-judgmental and will kind of help you get at, and then you can kind of help your friend that way. So we need to be able to be authentic. We need to, we need to be able to sharpen one another uh, real quickly, before we move on to the next thought, real quickly, I love that it says, iron, as iron sharpens iron. That's such a helpful metaphor that conveys we're in this together. Notice it's not saying gold sharpening bronze. I don't, I don't know. Uh, diamond sharpening copper. You know, it's the iron sharpening iron. We're in this together. It's not like there's a hierarchy in the relationship. You're not like, I'm ahead of you. And that, that's not even a part of the equation. It's like, we're just doing life and we're just there to try to help care, serve as best we can. So we need to be authentic. We need to be looking to sharpen. And then this last one in terms of forging relationships, the Proverbs gets at, which I'll go through pretty quickly here, is we need to be considerate. This one might sound like a Captain Obvious thought, but I don't think our culture is really talking about this one uh, as I see it. I might be wrong, but it, we need to be considerate. For, in fact, I know our culture is not really hitting this because like man, everything in our culture right now, Twitter and everything is opposite. We need to be considerate. Listen to Proverbs 25, 17. Seldom set foot in your friends or, or neighbor's or friend's house too much of you and they will hate you. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their friend or neighbor and says, I was only joking. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. These are all kind of interesting, aren't they? And if you stay, take time to like let them sink in, there's so much wisdom here, right? This last one I just think is, is really fascinating because like if anyone blesses their neighbor, how would that be taken as a curse? But obviously the point is if you do that early in the morning, it's like we understand the, wis the wise principle behind that. 
It's even good things need to take their, come in their appropriate time. And I imagine all of us can think of really quickly examples of inherently good things said at bad times toward bad effects. And that's what he's saying here. We got we to gotta be considerate. And then this the whole uh, don't seldom set foot or they're going to hate you thing. Uh, you know, in English, we, we have that saying, don't overstay your welcome. I think it's just saying, be mindful of your friend's time and energy. Be considerate. And then this one about like practical joking, like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their friend and says, I was only joking. Obviously, it's talking about tactless, practical jokes here. But I really think what it's saying there, underneath it, the principle is, don't take your friends for granted. By the way, that's one, personally, as funny as it sounds, I need to take to heart because I'm such a, like, kidster. As Cindy likes to say, like, when I'm off the preaching stage, like, over 50% of what I'm saying is just, like, I'm just messing with people. I just like, I just like that. I'm fourth child of six. I'm just constantly just, like, goading at people. But, like, I got to be careful there because if I'm coming across as a maniac shooting fly, which I can. <laughs> We're laughing, but I, I really can. I really can. There's some wisdom here. You got to be considerate. That's, that's what Paul's saying. Oh, I see Paul. Solomon's saying uh, from, from the book of Proverbs. Be considered. We need to put effort into thinking about our friends and caring for them for who they are and what they need. It's a reminder that friendship isn't a one-way street. It's a two-way street. Can't take them for granted. We need to be considered as we need to look to sharpen, as we need to be authentic, as we need to be intentional. All right, so there you have it. Wisdom from Proverbs on why friendship matters and how to forge it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful sage advice that we would all do well to ponder further and even look to implement this week. And I would just say strongly again, remembering the times that we're in where people are forgetting how to be friends. We've lost some of that habit, let alone, I think, this need even during quote-unquote normal times, whatever that means anymore. These are, this is important sage advice, but the best part of everything we're talking about is that it's not mostly about what we've been saying. Jesus at one point said the scriptures ultimately are about him. They ultimately point to him. There's a reason why the scriptures, not just in Proverbs, but across the board, Old Testament and New, have so much focus on friendship. And that's because friendship is near and dear to God's heart for you. And not just in some general abstract way. He wants you to be in friendship with him. Listen to Genesis 3, 8. This is on one of the first few pages of, of the Bible. Then the man and woman, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What a beautiful picture of what life was ultimately meant to be, that we would walk in the garden in the cool of the day with our Lord, with our God. That's friendship. Even as it's kind of painful to read that because we all know paradise was lost. You know, that same chapter, actually, our forebears decided, you know what, I'm, I don't need this friendship as much as I think I need. I'm going to do things my own way. And in, in many ways, friendship with God, at least in that intimate sense, was lost. But the rest of the Bible is essentially God pursuing us in order to bring us back into friendship with himself. So much of the scriptures continue to point. That's why in the second book of the Bible, Exodus, God spoke to Moses face to face, quote, as one who speaks to a friend. It's God speaking to a human being as a friend. And then Abraham is called a friend in 2 Chronicles and Isaiah 41. And then Psalm 25, it speaks of friendship with the Lord, how he confides in us. He makes his covenant known to us. Uh, this won't be on the screen, but Jesus, of course, was known as being friend of the sinners, and then towards the end of his life, here's what Jesus said. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. But most telling of all was the statement Jesus said right before he said those words. This is the most pinnacle manifestation of love. He said in, in John 15, 13, he says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And John 15 was recording Jesus' words that were just hours before he would go to the cross and lay down his life, not just for the people in that room, but for you and, and me, for everybody who would receive him, to bring us back into friendship with him. 
to bring us back into the place where Proverbs 17, 17, he would be a friend who loves at all times, even during times of adversity. Proverbs 27, 17, that he would look to sharpen us for our good. Proverbs 27, 10, that his promise would be to never forsake us, and he would keep that perfectly. So the question is, would you receive him? If you're here today and you've never received the gospel, which is literally means good news, is that God wants to be in friendship with you. He wants you to be in friendship with him. Will you have him? Begin a personal relationship. And he's made that possible for you by dying on the cross for your sins and mine, that if we receive that, we will receive life forever with him. Paradise restored when he comes back, that we might walk in the garden with him again in the cool of the day. I want to give you an opportunity to do that later if, that's a, if you're in a place where you'd like to receive him. And then if you have received his friendship, first of all, how could you lean into that friendship, his, his friendship with you? I mean, maybe that's, you just kind of stop and ponder. But his friendship with you, maybe, how could you lean into that? And then, and then along with that, how could you extend that same love and friendship that he offers not only to you, but for you to have with others and to others have with you? For some of you, it's going to mean being intentional. In fact, I would just stress that I think more than ever, we need to be intentional about friendship right now for a slew of reasons, not least of which coming out of a pandemic, we're still trying to figure all this stuff out. We've got to be intentional. You look for ways to be intentional. For others, it might mean being authentic, inviting people. Maybe you've never invited somebody in, into your life. And hey, I, I'll be real. That's kind of scary, you know? I mean, I, when I share with my buddy who I, whom I love, I'm always like, okay, how's he going to take it? He's loving. I, I appreciate that. Hopefully I'm that for him, that kind of deal. It, it, it takes putting ourselves out there, but the, it's, a, it, it's a perfume, it's an incense that's pleasant to, even to the joy of the heart. Maybe it's being authentic, maybe it's sharpening. Maybe it's in relationships like that, looking to lean in very graciously again, but to be that kind of friend relationship that you can be for others. There are all these ways that we can and lean into being, being friends for one another because friendship is just so, so valuable. And it's been made possible by the one who died, laid down his life to bring us into friendship for, with him. So let's not take that for granted, that wonderful friendship, and let's not take the friendship that the God gives us, even in this very room. Um, and, and best of all, let's just try our best current friends to follow our Lord, Savior, and friends' footsteps in all this. Now let's pray. Actually, as, as eyes are closed and, and heads are bowed, I want to give you an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, that if you'd like to receive what Jesus has done for you, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he came to die for your sins on the cross, that if you would receive what he has done there and that the Father raised him again on the third day for life, the promise is you will have forever life with him and be brought into relationship and friendship with him. I want to give you that opportunity if you're here today and you'd like to receive that. Maybe you've already received that. You never really kind of cemented that. I want to give you the opportunity now to raise your hand. And I will see it. I'll pray for you. But more importantly, God will see what's in your heart and receive you. I want to see, yes, I see that hand. I'll give you, yes, see another hand. A couple hands, yeah. A few more moments if you want to raise your hand. Pray for you. Father, I just want to pray, first of all, for these individuals who raised their hand. Uh, the best news here today is we, we can talk about wonderful wisdom, what it means to be a friend and why it matters, and we can all understand at the soul level that it's really important, and we need to lean into that. But the best news of all is you created us to be in friendship with you, in a personal relationship with you. So I want to pray, first of all, for these individuals who raised their hand, that you would meet them there as they choose to believe on you and receive what you've done for them, that you would receive them as we know you promised in your scriptures you would. And help us as a family come along and friends come alongside them as we journey together in this relationship that we all have with you. And then, Father, I want to pray for all of us that you would help us, especially in these times where it seems like things are more and more divisive in our culture and harder and harder in terms of time and busyness and all of that to miss out on these wonderful benefits of friendship that you offer to us. Would you help us in this? Would you help us be gracious? Because we're not going to get this right uh, very often, but we thank you that that's where the sacrifice of Jesus meets us even there. But please help us be a church that is, is a church of friends and extending that friendship to others still beyond us. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.